So there's a lot of basketball going on. Welcome back. This is Lock It or Leave It. We have Giannis and Jokic dueling in the FIBA World Cup qualifiers. Jordan Clarkson's representing the Philippines. Porzingis is hooping for Latvia. Luka's on Slovenia. Jonathan Kaminga is representing the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The international basketball scene is on the rise, and the WNBA playoffs is also on. But today, we will be focusing on the college hoops landscape. And before we get to our special guest, I want to get to the other host of the show, which is Cam. What's going on, man? How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. It was a great weekend of sports. The Bears won. Florida State won by 40. You know, college football's back. Big game, obviously, this week against LSU, but excited to get some hoops going. It's been a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. We have been getting a lot of the team on, a lot of the players, but we want to kind of shift to the coaching staff because that's where the culture, that's where I, I, where our identity is really found. So thank you to um, associate head coach Stan Jones for coming on. Thank you so much for giving us some of your time to come on and talk about FSU basketball. Well, first off, thank you guys for, for having me. I'm always humbled when somebody wants to uh, talk basketball with us in Florida State. Uh, basketball is our passion, and uh, being with Coach Hamilton all these years, it's uh, uh, I, I love spreading the good news of what he's built. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as we mentioned in the intro, you are the longest tenured assistant coach in ACC. 20 seasons at Florida State is Coach Ham's first hire, and since then you've helped turn this basketball program into a national powerhouse, not only in March Madness, but that success is also translated to the NBA draft. Can you take us through your thought process when uh, the opportunity to coach at Florida State first came along, and what has convinced you to stay all these years to call Tallahassee home? Well, thank you for asking those questions. Uh, you know, I've been with Coach Hamilton before I got to Florida State. I was hired out of being a high school coach in the, in the state of Mississippi uh, in 1995 to be a part of his staff at the University of Miami when he was turning that program into a, a dominant program in the Big East those last five years. I wasn't there during the hardship years. Uh, I got to be there as the turn happened, and we had a, a great five-year run there, uh, tying Connecticut uh, for the most number of wins in the conference and uh, going to three NCAA tournaments, the Sweet 16, winning the Big East regular season title in 2000, and, and, uh, and coaching a phenomenal group of guys. And then Coach Hamilton ended up becoming the, the head coach of the Washington Wizards. And, uh, again, I was blessed enough that he had enough confidence in me that he took me as one of his front of the bench coaches. Uh, and I was there with him for a year in the NBA, uh, working for Michael Jordan. And then uh, and he, uh, Michael decided to come back and play. So that's a whole nother story. We could do a whole nother show on that. So let's schedule that for later on. I'll, I'll bring you guys up to <laughs> yeah, some good how nuggets. the business of basketball really works. Yes, sir. That'd be awesome. Uh, but then uh, he was out and get, still getting paid by the Wizards for three more years. And I had to get it. I was only on a one year contract years with the Wizards. So I, I ended up being in Mississippi State for a year, and we won the SEC tournament, got to coach some tremendous guys that I still have great relationships with. And uh, I wasn't sure Coach Hamilton was going to get back into coaching. He had got into some radio stuff and media stuff like you guys are doing and seemed to be enjoying himself. And he called me the night we got eliminated from the NCAA tournament at Mississippi State and uh, and said, I'm taking the Florida State job. I know he'd been working with me on trying to maybe get a head coaching job. I had another school during the end of that year. I was at Mississippi State, and he said, I know we're working on this other part, but I'd love for you to come back and be my associate head coach, but I, we, I can't wait on you to decide in between. And so me being a person of kind of bird in the hand is better than two in the bush, I called the AD at the other school I'd been talking to, and he couldn't give me a timeline, so I pulled out of that job. And, and two days after Coach had his press conference, I was in Tallahassee, and uh, it's been a great run. And when you work for a guy like Coach Hamilton, uh, young guys don't really appreciate sometimes how experience like that is such valuable to your career. You know, and I, to people ask me, why have you not taken this? Well, number one, it's hard to get a head coaching job. But number two, when you work for a guy that whenever something goes wrong, he always takes the blame. And when something goes right, he always gives everybody else the credit. Uh, you don't find many leaders that are that selfless. Uh, and then that allows you to operate in your strengths. And he is just an incredible leader and CEO of our program. He's always been that way and is always concerned about your family. And my family was my, – my, my children are Florida State alumni, and uh, they actually all have got careers going in Tallahassee now. So it's just been the right place, right time, and where the, the, the divine providence has wanted me to be. And it's a great situation. Coach Hamilton is such a uh, terrific leader to work for. Yeah, Jay's been calling Coach Ham the godfather for a while now, so <laughs> – 
Yeah, so um, in Goodfellas, I would always say that Coach C.Y. was more like Jimmy. You know, he's in the field, he's doing all the stuff with the young guys. But then Pauly was was uh, Coach Ham. How you know everyone respects Pauly, but he's a little more reserved. He's a little more laid back, and he's not like in the forefront of everything. But I want to keep going off of that. And around two years ago, FSU's media team released a video of you mic'd up during practice. You pointed out how there's a uniqueness to coaching basketball. Unlike other sports, you don't get in between innings or huddles between plays. you got to be able to build those habits where the team can function as a unit of five for long periods of time without a stoppage. So how important is it as a coaching staff to make team practices as transferable as possible to the game in order to give players that reference point to work off of rather than just flow reacting as they get in the game? Well, I think the uh, the, the whole key to anybody you've seen being considered a great coach in the, in the sport of basketball over the – over 100 years that basketball has been being played. We, we were kind of unique this year. We got to go to uh, Canada to play a tour in August. And uh, we played, our last game was at McGill University. And since you're referencing uh, Goodfellas, you may know the, uh, uh, the trivia question to McGill University, but James Naismith, who invented basketball, was a graduate of McGill University. So the game was actually invented by the Canadian, even though he did it in Springfield, Massachusetts, working at the YMCA. And... I've always believed this, and I've tried to emulate this in my coaching career, that the best coaches have always been the best teachers. Uh, that You don't just coach. You don't just demand. You don't just th throw a lot of energy and uh, activity and demand some places until you teach them exactly the, the progressions of how something should look, operate, feel, and, and then do the reps in it so it becomes habits and instincts for you. And so I've always patterned my career all the way back to the 14 years I was a head high school coach of uh, being the best teacher I could so that when things don't go right, that you can always go back and ask a question to a player, what should we have done in that situation? And if they can't give you an answer, the fault's my problem. I didn't do a very good job of explaining it to them. So that's always been my approach as being that even when they're going to screw up, you're going to have problems in the game. It's a game that goes so fast and for such extended periods of time without stops that if you don't uh, have a chance to, at that moment say, now what should we have done there? You can't get better the next time that shows up because the scouting reports are so intricate. That's going to show back up. So you have to be able to teach it so that they can give you the, the how and the why at the end of the day so that they can now, the next time they see it, react accordingly and make the play, play that's best for us and for them as an individual. Yeah, so kind of making a transition to some of the success of last season. When we interviewed Coach C.Y. right before the start of last year, we asked him that what was one player that he expected to take a leap and become a key player, and that player for him was Raekwon Evans. And I think it's safe to say he was a problem last season. Loads of clutch shots, multiple late-game free throws. How much did Ray mean to our team, and who do you think that player will be for the Knowles in the upcoming season? Well, you know, Ray, as good as he had last year, he had a lot of unfortunate things and adversity he had to deal with. You know, he was really playing well early, and then the night before we are playing Missouri in the championship game over in Jacksonville, his, his, his brother, who he kind, of, he kind of looked up to and emulated as an older brother, had been a big uh, inspiration in his life, passed away from an illness that took him really quick, uh, and uh, uh, spent a lot of time with him. In fact, he had the, the, the prayers and the, and the time we had to spend in the locker room just for him to be able to go out and and feel confident he could play that night. Uh, took a lot of emotional energy to, to get him to that point and to win the game and to see his appreciation for his teammates and for the uh, uh, the way he played that night was uh, an absolute inspiration in a tragic moment. And I'll always remember that about Ray and that that carried on throughout the year. And I mean, um, you know, it's you know, grieving is a process that nobody ever gets over. And you never know the exact time. And there were still moments in the year uh, where Ray was still struggling with his own personal mental health and well-being in terms of those situations. And that's natural. It's human. We're all that way. And so as good as Ray was and, and, and see why I was right, I expected him to have a big jump last year because uh, he, he played with Trent Forrest and he played uh, in a situation where he, he, knew, he knew what it was supposed to look like as a senior. And then he had that uh, unfortunate little knee injury there for the, that sidelined him a little bit late in the year. Uh, but, yeah, one of the great stories I'll always remember about Ray and we talked about it. We're, we're at the end of the, uh, the season. And he'd had several of the games where he made those free throws at the end of the year. And so as a coach, you get in a timeout, you're supposed to be talking about what's going to happen if he makes them, what's going to happen if he misses it, because it could be two different scenarios based on the score differential. And we talked about if Ray makes these, we're going to be in this. And then we said, 
if he makes this, we're going to be doing this. And before you, we got through explaining it, he was, Coach, I'm not going to miss. He said that in front of his teammates, and they're like, okay, let's don't, let's don't talk anymore. Go take care of business, Ray. We'll stay with option A, and let's go from there. But that's the kind of confidence you love to see guys grow into and uh, to be an experienced player in your program. And um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a story I'll carry with me with about Ray uh, for the rest of my career. Yeah, Ray's a great guard, but you excel at coaching big men also, and especially when they're given more to do on the court than traditional bigs here at in uh, at FSU. So tell me if I'm wrong, but I feel like as if big men have to grow through that psychological process of being boxed in into a certain archetype early on in their career based on their size compared to other people. We interviewed John Butler last year, and he explicitly stated that a big factor for his commitment to FSU stemmed from our coaching staff showing him how his versatility would be enhanced and accentuated in this seminal system. When recruiting, how important is it to not only find talent, but also talent that fits into how we want to play here at Florida State? Well, to, to touch back on the question that was asked previously before we go into that, when he asked about who could break through this year, and since you talked about big men, um, the guy that the light, I think, has turned on, and I'm hoping it becomes very bright, is uh, Naheem McLeod, because he is such a unique, gifted human being just from a genetic perspective, but he's also gifted with a lot of skill that people haven't always seen out of it, and he really could be a problem. He's, uh, outside of Jalen Ganey, who's transferred in from Brown, uh, I think he's the most, the, the oldest player chronologically on our team this year, so he's at that point that hopefully... Um, age is starting to become a positive for him instead of being a negative. And like, you know, when you're young, they always say that the problem with youth is it's wasted on the young and that he was kind of that way. And he had a really good uh, summer of work. You could see him growing in confidence and, uh, and consistency. Uh, you saw that in the first two games up at, uh, at, uh, in Canada, when we played this summer, uh, the third game, he wasn't feeling quite well and he hadn't been in that kind of grind. And that's also your body's got to acclimate to that. And so he knows that. So that's a big thing for him here in the preseason and getting ready. But uh, I won't be shocked to see Naheem to have a, a, a year that other people are kind of, you already kind of know who you would expect to do things. So no sense putting those, but I think Naheem McLeod could be a key, a big key to uh, the how high we climb this year in terms of success. Um, so the second thing is, you know, I'm a really big believer in this. Uh, and I've been that way even since I coached in high school and all the way through Coach Hamill's career. I always believe in you, con you coach a complete player. You don't just com coach a complete position. So versatility has always been a big part of our recruitment all the way back to when I joined Coach Hamilton at the University of Miami. We didn't want guys that just were going to be positional. You know, when, I, when I tell guys they're only doing one thing in practice, I always kind of kid them and say, hey, uh, you're, you're being a field goal kicker today. And, you know, we, in basketball, you can't just really have a field goal kicker. All you do is go in and kick, and then you go back and stand on the sideline. And so uh, we, we really work hard, and you'll see when you come to – you know, hopefully you'll come when the media is invited to practice. Hopefully you guys will come out and they'll get that message to you. And you'll see, we, we include our bigs in all of our shooting drills perimeter. We include, we have our guards work in post-up situations. So when they get in those situations, they can be productive. We have everybody work on ball handling, passing uh, skills and trend and being able to, to do, you know, and then, then as we see what they really, their limits are, then we kind of build their, their structure around them of, okay, you're a, you're a minimal dribble guy, but you know, we want you to be able to trust yourself that, we brought you here. We wanted to see you become better than just a one-dimensional guy. And so we had that. So you'll see, uh, you know, you saw John's versatility in shooting the ball in the perimeter last year. And I think you'll see John, uh, uh, excuse me, Nate, Naheem. You'll see Jalen Ganey. You'll see Cameron Corhan, our incoming uh, freshman young man from Dallas who played at a really fine program at Central, uh, Sunrise Christian last year. You're going to see them out more in dribble handoff situations, quick pitch and follow, quick ball screens that are hard for people to get their – their coverage is too. Uh, you're going to see them a little bit more in the pick and pop situations than you've seen in some of our bigs in the past. And that's just something that's a, a philosophy of our program is we, we want to build completeness in guys. So they're not just good for us, but when they leave us, they can be good to themselves and be able to fit in whatever level they get to, whether it's the NBA or if they end up being a Euro league or international player that uh, they can go in and find their niche in those situations and not be limited. Cause I, I really believe this, the health of a program, you guys touched on a little bit earlier is when I was a high school coach is if you don't have guys going to college, your program's not very healthy. And if you're in the, in the college program, if you don't have consistent guys going and playing at pretty high levels and being able to perform at those levels uh, and people don't realize how good the levels you mentioned on FIBA early when you started the show, 
I mean, man, and that's an incredible level of basketball. So you got to have guys prepared to go do that. Uh, and it's funny, I got I text I text Ray this weekend to check and see how he's doing, and he texts me back and said, "Coach, I love it here. I've transitioned easily because of what you guys taught us." And uh, I shared that with our with our current team. I said, then again, this is our goal. We want you guys to leave us and you be confident in where you are once you leave Florida State so you're prepared for life. Yeah, so going off that, we've had some elite recruits come uh, visit Florida State, and uh, they didn't end up getting an offer, mainly because, as CY mentioned, they would rather have the hand, the ball in their hand 30 to 35 minutes a game, shooting 20 shots. Obviously, Florida State doesn't run that kind of system, but we've seen Seminoles had success translating to the NBA. Former podcast guests and pro, uh, pro basketball players Terrence Mann and Trent Forrest making huge impacts in games while primarily operating as an off-ball guard. I want you to put on your NBA hat for a second what do you think nba scouts think now about players coming out of florida state well i, I really believe you can go and find a lot of research on, on a lot of comments all the way back to uh, when doc rivers was with the celtics they really believe that uh, uh, players coming out of florida state are going to be uh, tough they're going to be tough-minded they're going to be willing to guard in whatever situations and take on challenges they're going to be versatile and be able to fit a role uh, because, I mean, you may have seen there was a, uh, there was a, um, this past weekend, there was a video out there of Draymond Green talking at a, uh, a workout runs that were going on in LA. And he talked and he was, what he has said is the absolute truth about the NBA. There's only one or two guys at that level that are going to get to run around and do what they want to do. He used a couple more colorful phrases than I use, but, uh, that, and then he said, everybody else has got to fill a role. And so uh, we've had so many guys now that it's proven. I, I actually had an NBA front office guy. Not too long ago, I said, we've gotten in our office that if there's a Florida State guy available, we just tell our people to pick them because they're going to be able to come in and, and find a way to translate and transition into what an NBA team's trying to do, whether you ask them to be on the ball, off the ball, uh, in the spot up, or, or and, and they're all going to guard and they're all going to play hard. And uh, they're also they're, they're going to know how to be good in the locker room because we work very hard on trying to have the, uh, the most uh, close-knit and the most kind of uh, – chemistry in a locker room in the country that's one of our goals every year is being able to have that kind of uh, togetherness where we have each other's back and I think that translates because that NBA locker room is hard man it's a different animal than what they had in college because you're in there dealing with 15 alpha males and you've got to be able to be able to get your, your your share of the food and get your bark on being an alpha male as well so we try to coach on leadership as part of our versatility training as well as the skill development. Yeah, when we had Trent on, he was talking about the same thing. When you walk into that jazz locker room and you see Jordan Clarkson, who's a professional scorer, who was um, under Kobe's wing coming up, and you've seen Donovan Mitchell, three-time defensive player of the year, Rudy Gobert, you have to acclimate quick. You have to come back to normal quick. And I'm glad you mentioned Draymond, because that was actually my next question to you. You said what he said. Let's just play the clip right here. But at the end of the day, motherfuckers got to play a role in the NBA. Yes. It's too much. Like you said, he said it in a little more colorful way than other people would really like to hear. But as a coach to players who are making that transition from high school to college to the NBA, how important is it to make their game balanced, like you said earlier, in order for them to be malleable and fit into all different types of play? No, it's, it's crucial. I mean, that's probably the secret sauce. And we talk about that with our guys. We, we spend a lot of time educating our team on the statistics that NBA analytics truly follow. And it's not the box score that mom and dad see on the internet or post game if they're not at the game. And, you know, I've, I've been doing this a long time and I coached in the NBA and I've coached a lot of guys that have played in the NBA. And we got a lot of our former players are not just playing in the NBA. We got a lot of those guys working in the NBA. I don't know if you've noticed, but, you know, Luke Laux is now on the front of the bench assistant for the Sacramento Kings. Davis Dulkies is working as a player development coach for the uh, Sacramento Kings. Jason Marsh was a manager for us. He's the head G League coach for the Memphis Grizzlies. Michael Joyner is his top assistant who played for us. And Jeff Peterson is the assistant general manager for the Brooklyn Nets. And I can just go down that list for quite a long time and take up too much of your, your podcast time. But we've tried to teach our guys the business of basketball. And so being able to take that transition from the college game. To, so we educate our guys and we get information from our players that are now working in the NBA of what are you actually working for? Coach Hamilton and I recruited James Jones 
uh, and coached him at the University of Miami. If we call James and say, James, what's on your board about our guys? James is going to give us different information than somebody that we just may know from a business perspective because we have a lot of shared locker room and a lot of shared experiences together. And so we try to get that and share it with our guys so they really realize how you're getting evaluated is a lot different than the general fan and maybe your family and maybe the Internet thinks you're getting evaluated. And that's why you see a guy like Terrence Mann be so productive in the NBA because he understands how to make himself valuable, whether he has the ball in his hand or not. And you're seeing that out of a lot of other guys. But you also see Scotty Barnes make that kind of transition. And, man, I wish we could have had him for a whole year where we had a, a, a true summer with him, a true preseason, a complete season. Because even though we went to the Sweet 16, I think we'd have done a lot more damage if he could have matriculated through that throughout the whole process and only getting about 75% of a college season. Because I knew he was going to transition uh, into that kind of player in the NBA because, number one, he, he, he loves the hoop now. He'll play for free in the blacktop somewhere. Forget about the contract he's getting because, I mean, basketball is his passion. It's not just something he likes the benefits from. Uh, but I told the, the, the front office people from the Raptors when they were doing their intel, I said, don't worry about what he scored for us. He's going to do whatever he's got to do to get on the court and find a way. And he's going to impact your locker room before he, inter, 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 uh, before he affects your 94 by 50 court because he has that kind of charisma and personality and, and confidence in himself. And I was so glad to see him become rookie of the year, not just because it, it puts a shine on Florida State, but it puts a shine on, okay, play the game for the right reason. And that's what Scotty Barnes did. And uh, I was, I'm, I'm so happy for him that, it, that he's been able to get that way. And he may become pretty quickly here one of those one or two guys on the team who gets to do what the heck he wants to do, like they, you were just talking about in that clip, because he plays it, but he, he'll also do what it takes to win. And that, that's what matters. And I think that's, uh, that's something you've seen in all our guys coming out here uh, for a while now, you know, and, I, and I use the hashtag on the little bit of social media I do called Winners Win. And we've had winning guys in our program that want to win. You know, Jonathan Isaac, when he got here, he was a big turn in that locker room too because he was the happiest guy in the locker room as long as he won. He didn't care what he scored. He just wanted to win. And, and uh, I think you're going to see that. Uh, I think you're going to see that translating to him now that he's getting back healthy. Yeah, for Terrence Mann, two quick things. Uh, we asked Terrence Mann this question. We said, "It was when you got drafted, was it intimidating or did, were you relieved when you realized you're going to be playing with this much talent, with Paul George, Kawhi Leonard? That was when Joe Kim Noah was there, Patrick Beverly, Montrez Harrell, Lou Williams. You got a lot of NBA veterans in there. And he said it's, it was a little bit of both because you realize – I'm going to practice every day with Kawhi and PG. And even though you may see me in the regular season games, the practices are actually where the iron's being sharpened. And we'd see him in the box score have two points or one point. But in 15 minutes of play, he has seven rebounds. He has four assists. Yeah. He has two blocks. And then what do we see in the playoffs? He's the primary defender on Luka Doncic. So we're seeing him really being able to um, hone in on what he um, excels at because he has the other pieces around him. And then like Scotty. And you said um, Scotty's love for the game. I saw a video of Rico Hines with him a week and a half ago where he's guarding James Harden, and he's guarding him like it's game seven of the NBA Finals, and it's a two-point game with a minute left. And James Harden said, you know what? After the game, he said, I respect Scotty for that because he's playing how you should at all times. Cam? Yeah, I mean, you both touched it. I was, you just touched on what I was going to say anyways. But one other thing, I'm glad, Stan, you mentioned the, uh, the box score is, definitely does not show the whole story. A lot of, a lot of people these days, uh, Jay and I affectionately call them couch analysts, like to just look <laughs> at the box scores after the games and uh, clearly don't tell the whole story a lot of the time. I mean, you just mentioned seven rebounds. Is, that's that's game-changing right there, especially in a playoff game. Yeah, so this has been a great interview so far. We're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to end out with the Duke – First FSU basketball game. Don't go anywhere. This is my favorite part. We'll be right back. Okay, so for this Duke game, we closed last week's pod out by sharing our favorite sports memories at Florida State while being students. My go-to choice was the first women's soccer game I ever went to. We won in the 89th minute. Great game. Never missed a soccer game after that. Our co-host, Aaron, who isn't here today, stated that his favorite sports memory at FSU was the Miami football game last season when we converted a crucial 4th and 14 to keep the drive alive and win the game. 
but Cam said his was the Duke basketball game. If you didn't know, Cam and I are the people that dress by Null Zone. Cam has the Batman suit on. I have the Kiss ha- um, hair on with the face paint on white. And we will always be there, baseline, rooting for the team. Cam, I want to see both sides of the coin. So, Cam, can you start off walking us through your experience leading up to the game, during and after? And then Coach Jones, can you follow him up by talking about your experience on game day against Duke and what you were thinking of in those huddles, what the huddle was like in those last second moments when uh, everyone was just leaning out of their seats because the atmosphere was amazing. Yeah, Jay, I already got chills from you, uh, from just you talking about it like that. But obviously, I mean, being a part zone was, uh, was awesome, especially when we get to the arena an hour and a half before the game starts, as you mentioned. So we really get to see the arena absolutely fill up and like, this is the kind of atmosphere that you just dream about when you, as a sports fan, like you, you not a single, I've never been in a stadium so loud at one time, especially, especially in overtime, like Jay sitting, Jay's standing literally right next to me. And I can't hear a single thing he's saying because of how we're standing on the bleachers for uh, those of you who don't know, like literally right behind the basket, the bleachers are shaking. Like I'm trying, there's everybody was, everybody was like around me. And like, if we win, like, if we win, we got to rush the court. If we win, we got to rush the court. And I was like, first of all, we're going to win. Number two, please stop pushing me because we're going to break this rail if we don't get, if we don't stop. Unbelievable atmosphere. Obviously, we got out the win, but I'll let you take over, Stan. Well, that's uh, – if you guys are there on November the 7th this year, I'm coming over to dap you guys up every time you're there. So make sure you get those same outfits and so I can find it. And, you know, the, the good thing about that energy in the Duke game it's now become kind of uh, uh, vogue and chic to be that way at, at FSU basketball games, which certainly wasn't there when we took over 20 years ago. Uh, you go back to that. You, you know, I see you got your Michael Jordan dunk poster in your background there, Cam, but you need to change that to the Trent Forrest dunk on Jordan Wara in the Louisville game in the COVID year, which uh, uh, that, that the place was rocking pretty hard that night. And that, that moment probably doesn't happen though, because of some of the, the rivalry we've created with Duke over the years. And our fans and the passion of getting behind that because you know, in all the years we've uh, we've had a, some incredible games with Duke, uh, and I think it goes back to a little bit of it's a little bit of philosophy, but it's also a little bit of competitive pride. You know, when we took over, obviously, uh, when when we took over in Miami, Coach Hamilton wanted to you know Connecticut and Georgetown and St. John's were the were the bell cows of that league, and then. When we come here, I really knew it was going to be Duke and Carolina. So everything we've tried to do and how we've tried to create a little bit different uh, mousetrap or something was to we wanted to be able to compete and we wasn't taking any back seats to anybody that's supposed to be. That's where the Blue Bloods, New Bloods thing came up. And, you know, I know one year CY had the uh, the scout on Duke and he always talked about that a lot of people get beat by – they get the – they have the 20-point uh, – I don't know how you put it. People give out the 20-point Duke you get worried about what's on their shirt before you even play and we're not going to ever have that and that started all the way back to when when coach took over we were going to find a way that uh, win or lose they were going to know we were in the gym and uh, so uh, we had some uh, we had some great moments we've had a few court stormings and we've tried to also build our system offensively and defensively where whether we had nine mcdonald's all americans like like they may have had uh, and we had our had our burger king or popeyes all americans we were going to be able to find a way to make it a game and give ourselves a chance to win. And I think we've done that. And I think uh, Coach Krzyzewski over the years was always one of the few people that would always kind of tip his hat to us for the the way we built the program at Florida State. And now we just got to continue to push it on out there. And we got the young fellow that's taking Coach K's place. We got to make sure we keep it on him too. Yeah, so you you knew, though, this year that I've, once that game went to overtime, that if we won that game, all the fans were storming the court. You, you knew that, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no question that was going to happen. Yeah, and I, w- and I wish when we went back to their place that our whole starting five wasn't in, dre- in street clothes two or three weeks later when we returned the game because it's weird how that season played out last year that we go from top of the league after winning that game against Duke and at Miami to our whole starting five getting hurt. Yeah, so when Trent came on, he talked about the um, the Cam Reddish game winner in Florida State when we were freshmen and we remember this because we were freshmen watching that game and it's full circle because now we're seniors rushing the court for you know our our last game against Duke so it was really interesting to see that but one key thing I um, remember from this game 
was the dominance that we had on the offensive glass. Naheem had six offensive rebounds. Matthew Cleveland had three. Cameron Fletcher had three. No one on the Duke roster had more than two. So can you talk about how much of an emphasis you put on offensive rebounding and second chance points? Because I'm not an exceptional basketball player. But when I do play, it seems as if the whole or half the battle of rebounding is just who wants the ball more. Oh, it ain't half. It's probably more than that. It's, it's, it, you go back to all the great rebounders in the history of the game. They've always had that. They just want the ball, and they, they expect the ball to be theirs when they get through it. So you, uh, you already have the advantage on that. And, but it also goes back to preparation using statistical analysis and stuff. And you look at what strengths and weaknesses of teams that can be, and you start looking for a way that how are we going to produce more points than Duke's going to produce, maybe with them playing a lot of iso ball, how are we going to make sure that if they've got an advantage there, where's our advantage going to be? And uh, this past year, we really felt that would be a huge advantage for us. And our kids bought into the scout report and were phenomenally aggressive, great passion, but they're also great uh, passionately on the other end, making sure that Duke didn't get to the offensive glass. And we took care of both ends of the court with our rebounding effort. And uh, you know, that so many people that uh, look at the game nowadays because of the, 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 the Twitter mob, they can put all the, all the highlights of just people dunking on somebody or hitting step back threes. You know, they don't realize that the, that ability, you just talked about Terrence getting seven rebounds, those are invaluable parts of you being able to win, but also invaluable parts of you becoming valuable for jobs after you leave your college career. And so we really work hard on trying to educate our guys to, to believe in them, buying in that, and find a way that every game is going to be organic. Every game is going to have a different way it gets started and how it's going to finish. How are we going to be able to adapt to how that game, you know, it's just like a seed that gets planted. Some days it's going to rain and some days the sun's going to shine. And you're going to have to be able to find a way to be productive, whether it's going good for you or not. And, you know, whether the other team has a good game plan, too, and how, how do we adapt into that game plan that the other team throws against us? Because they have scouting reports just like we do. So that's really important to us. And I think that's, that's, that's been, a, been a big part of our success in getting our program to be, in the, you know, in the top three or four teams in the league every year consistently. Jay knows this quote because I posted this on my Instagram after the uh, after the win. Simply incredible. Florida State wins its 13th straight overtime game. Never been done before. Florida State 79, Duke 78. Never get involved in a land war against Asia and never get involved in an overtime game against Leonard Hamilton. That is fabulous. Can you send that to me so I'll have that? I may make that and put it on the on the wall in the locker room for oh, a guy. Oh man, That's that fabulous. is awesome. Absolutely, we will get <laughs> that to you, stat. We'll get it to you, stat. So that will wrap up the interview for today, Coach Jones. Thank you again for hopping on. Let's start these sign offs. Cam, thank you for coming on, man. Great episode. Great insight into about um into FSU basketball. Yeah, absolutely. Always good to talk some hoops. I cannot wait for the weekend. I'm headed to New Orleans to watch Florida State play against LSU. I cannot wait. I'm counting down the days at work. So more sports coming your way, more great podcast episodes coming out. Yeah, and thank you for that. Coach Jones, we won't be there this season for basketball, but we will make sure to let the people under us who are now doing our jobs that they have to carry that torch, keep that same responsibility of being the sixth man. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, just great insight today, and winners win. I love that cash, you know. Winners win. Well, if you do come back to, to the to a game or whatever you do this year, please let, let me know you're coming. I appreciate you guys being in love with FSU basketball. And I love you guys' passion for the game because it's, it's, it's one of the greatest games, if not the greatest game ever, uh, in terms of just how a team could be. And I won't be in New Orleans with you, Cam, but because uh, we'll be doing team building stuff. We will be watching the team and hoping to coach Norvell and the, and the football guys build on the momentum they started this weekend. Absolutely. So the spread is at minus three. LSU is the favorite. I don't think that is how the game is going to play out. Can't wait. A lot of, like I said, FIBA World Cup qualifiers are happening. The World Cup is soon on the way. We saw Brianna Stewart against the Storm. I mean, for the Storm, go off against the Aces. Sports is slowly trickling back. It's that time. It's that time of the year where everything's flooding back and we can't wait. But um, can you talk about Mississippi real quick, Coach? Because I saw your um, your tweet about Mississippi and and what what's happening over there right now. Yeah, you know, uh, I coached high school ball for five years in Jackson, Mississippi, and uh, I just happened to see on a, as I was watching some Weather Channel stuff, uh, the Pearl River goes right through the middle of Jackson, and uh, they've had like the second highest rainfall in a month uh, in the history of of the city, and uh, their baseball field's already underwater. 
And so I know that their campus and I know a lot of the kids that I coached are now grown men and have families and, and reside in that area. So I'm just prayerful that they uh, don't have a lot of property damage and a lot of stuff that, uh, that comes about from a natural disaster like that. So thank you for thinking of that and sharing it. But you know, being a person of faith, I, I believe that uh, the, the more you can get out there to believe it in things, better things will happen for, for you, those and the ones you love. Yes, sir. We'll be praying for everybody in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, with that being said, thank you guys for listening again. Once again, this is Lock It or Leave It, and we will be back on Friday with another episode. Until then, we will see you guys later. Peace.